everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Bernie Tolson, and I am the Chief of the Department of Public Safety. I'm going to start off by just having a moment of silence for those impacted in our community in the last week. Thank you. Our community has experienced multiple tragedies in the last week. A woman was shot multiple times. A man lost his life. A family lost their home and the belongings as many officers were fired upon, including a Kalamazoo County Sheriff's deputy who was injured. I want to express our condolences on behalf of the city of Kalamazoo to the family and friends and loved ones of Mr. Rawls and the impacted neighborhood and family that has been uprooted. Each of these tragedies was a direct result of the actions of Alex Raw. I first want everyone to know that the city of Kalamazoo has taken every action possible to provide assistance to the family that lost their home as a direct result of this incident. These efforts begun while the standoff was ongoing. We are making sure that they have a place to live and we are working with many of the communities to do everything we can to replace the things that they lost. I want to thank everyone in our community who has supported this family in the time of need. This has been a fluid situation that has evolved rapidly and I want to apologize for the delay in addressing our community. This is an ongoing investigation and I have been limited on what information I can provide. Before getting into the details, I want you to know what happened on November 8th. I first want to walk through a timeline of events dating back to October that led up to this event. Sunday, October 24th. Mr. Rawls punched his ex-girlfriend approximately 10 times with a closed fist in the back and head. She was treated at Bronson Hospital for a possible spinal fracture. The case was presented to the Kalamazoo County Prosecutor's Office for review. Monday, November 1st, at approximately 1.49 p.m., Mr. Rawls arrived at a home in the 600 block of West Ransom and was looking for his ex-girlfriend that he had previously assaulted. The ex-girlfriend's sister opened the door and recognized Mr. Rawls. She observed a gun in his hand and she told him that sister, or her sister wasn't there and closed the door. He, Mr. Rawls, immediately began shooting through the door and hit her five times in her back. Mr. Ross then shot an additional 17 times into the house as he was leaving. Additionally, the victim of the shooting was transported to Johnson Hospital in critical condition. Mr. Ross called the victim's sister multiple times as she was at the hospital and stated that she was, he was around the corner from the hospital watching police. He threatened to come to shoot both her and her sister causing Bronson Hospital to go on a lockdown as law enforcement continues to search for the suspect. Additionally, another relative of the family reported to the detective that Mr. Rawls told him, and I quote, that he wanted to shoot it out with the police, unquote. Wednesday, November 3rd, the Kalamazoo County Prosecutor's Office issued of multiple felony arrest warrants for the shooting of his ex-girlfriend's sister. The warrants included assault with the intent to murder, two counts of felony firearm, and felony, felony, excuse me, and possession of a firearm. Friday, November 5th, the Kalamazoo County Prosecutor's Office issued a felony warrant for a third offense of domestic violence stemming from the incident on October 
Monday, November 8th, at approximately 10.45 a.m., after actively following up with all possible leads, the suspect, Mr. Rawls, was tracked to 1523 Washington Avenue in the city of Kalamazoo. Due to the extreme danger that Mr. Rawls posed to the community and officers, detectives and officers established a perimeter around the house and began making announcements for the occupants to exit the home and for Mr. Rawls to surrender. Two adults and two children came out. One of the adults was identified as the renter, Andrea Young. Ms. Young told detectives that Mr. Rawls had been staying at her residence since Thursday, November 4th, and had been sleeping on the living room couch. She said Mr. Rawls was friends with her boyfriend. Prior to these events, Mr. Rawls had an extensive criminal history, including multiple acts of violence. Those charges included attempting to disarm a firearm from a police officer, felony resisting and obstructing an officer while causing injury, three additional convictions for resisting and obstructing a police officer, domestic violence, knowing assaulting a pregnant individual, fleeing and eluding, home invasion, firearm possession of a felon, and multiple convictions for domestic violence. Finally, after searching for nearly a week on the morning of November 8th, my team was able to track Mr. Rawls to that address in the 1500 block of Washington Avenue. Mr. Rawls refused to surrender, instead choosing to repeatedly shoot at law enforcement officers over a 16-hour period. During this time, Mr. Rawls repeatedly fired a high-powered rifle at law enforcement officers, causing injury to one and endangering the lives of many citizens in our community, as well as officers. Now I want to show a few videos, but I want to put a disclaimer. Please be aware that these videos are graphic in nature and language can be explicit. Get him out of there! Damn, he 
Get out. And now he's sitting here. Damn. He got something for real, bro. Damn. After negotiating for several hours to convince Mr. Rawls to surrender, including efforts by his family and friends, were not successful. We also deployed more than 50 non-lethal chemical agents in hopes of causing Mr. Rawls to leave the house. This tactic was also unsuccessful and further action was necessary. In order to bring this standoff to a peaceful conclusion and the likely, and, excuse me, and to reduce the likelihood of injury or death to the citizens living in the neighborhood and the law enforcement officers at the scene, it was decided that limited destruction of the home, consisting of 40 doors, windows, and walls would be done. This was necessary because attempting to enter the home was likely to result in the death of law enforcement officers. The tactic of porting is open your doors and windows, walls, to allow officers to determine the location of the suspect without going inside, assisting and compelling the suspect to surrender, allowing for additional intervention techniques, increase the accessibility for communication, and allows for additional surrender points. Again, Mr. Rawls responded, not by surrendering, but instead repeatedly firing at law enforcement officers. Mr. Rawls was on the second floor of the house, and due to the limitations of the equipment available, we were unable to port the upstairs wall. Officers transitioned to a more direct and destructive tactic. This resulted in the systematic removal, or excuse me, removing the support system of the first floor, which created an opening in the second. At multiple points during the 16-hour standoff, Mr. Rawls fired at law enforcement officers on the scene. The standoff concluded at approximately 3 a.m. Because of the porting, the direct destruction of the first floor supports, law enforcement was now able to use drone technology, which captured Mr. Rawls as he again began shooting as law It was at this time officers from the Kalamazoo County Sheriff's Office and the Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety returned fire. Mr. Rawls was struck by the return gunshots. A few minutes later, Mr. Rawls was observed using his own gun to take his life. Everything was done by law enforcement was to avoid the outcome of further injury or loss of life. The top priority of law enforcement is to keep the community safe. We are always concerned about the people around us. My second priority is the safety of my team and all officers on the scene. I will not send my officers into a hell of gunfire. 
While this unfortunate damage was caused to this home, we prioritize lives before property. Property is always secondary to human life. That damage made to the structure was unsafe for anyone to enter, thus leading to its further destruction after Mrs. Ross remains were recovered. Ultimately, the entire structure had to be demolished. I requested the Michigan State Police Department to conduct an independent investigation of the officer-involved shooting. Upon this completion, it will be turned over to the prosecuting attorney, Jeff Gaddy, for the review. Before I close out, I want to thank our mutual aid partners, many of which are here today. The Portage Police Department, the Kalamazoo Township Police Department, Western Michigan University Police Department, Battle Creek Police Department, the Michigan State Police Department, and the Kalamazoo County Sheriff's Department for assistance. I want to say a special thanks to my house, the offices of the Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety, my leadership, the city manager's office, and the commission for their leadership and roles in this incident. Now I'll show a few in it, excuse me, images that will highlight the threat that was posed to our community and team by the actions of Mr. Ross. That is the weapon Mr. Ross possessed, the assault rifle. That's a part of the tactic. Uh, the tactic was to begin to support the home in order to uh, gain access for officers to have an unobstructed view of inside of the home that Mr. Ross was hiding in at that time. Is there history supporting this tactic? Have the ADPS ever done this before? Yes, we have. We have supported uh, homes before. Maybe not in this magnitude, but so we have used specifically. We have not done this tactic that the cause of this structure to collapse. We were previously told that the deputy was not injured. He had tripped or fallen. Was he shot? How was he injured then? Um, the deputy sustained injury from blast from the, from the shooting of Mr. Ball into a vehicle. So blast from a windshield or something like that hit him? That's correct. Uh, yes, Chief. Do you know how Ross got his hands on that firearm, as well as can you elaborate on the, maybe the ammunition he used? Say that again for me. Could you um, maybe elaborate on how Ross got his hands on the gun, as well as what type of ammunition he used? I do not know that. How many rounds did Ross fire at you? Several. Was the first time officer shot back at him around that 2.50 a.m. timeline? No other shots were fired before that? Say that again. Was the first time officers fired at the house around that 2.50 a.m. time? No uh, shots, no bullets were fired earlier than 2.50? That's correct. That is correct. Chief, when it comes to uh, porting a home, is there any uh, necessary requirement in city, county, state, federal code, whatever, 
for the uh, responding authorities to notify and ask for the landlord or for the tenant's permission to port the home given the circumstances? Given the circumstances and the fluid situation, uh, I, I don't necessarily have time to go into uh, requesting permission to do something. At this time, my, my, my mission is to save our community and the officers that are out there. And that's what that mission was. Um, obviously, there is someone who owns this home with worth money. Um, it, will the city be paying back or not? How that The homeowner of that home will be paid fair market value for that home. That's correct. Um, so, uh, this was a private home. If this had been an empty movie theater or a business um, with a similar situation, I guess I, you know, we haven't seen this. You said it's happened before, but we haven't seen it to this extent. I'm wondering if you would do this in a business, and was there a react team, a SWAT team? I know you went through many departments that were there, but what teams, tactical teams, were involved in, in how this particular situation went on? It was the Calumas and Metro SWAT team which consists of all five agencies in this county. And, and is, would the same policy have been applied to a business? I can't give hypotheticals, but my first priority is to save lives. Is it problematic for the investigation that the house has been demolished? I mean, it was a crime scene. We can no longer get into that home. That's correct. We can no longer get into the home. No evidence. I can no longer get in the home. Uh, you spoke about establishing a perimeter to keep neighbors safe, but there were lots of people up really close. Were neighbors evacuated, and why were people not pushed back farther than they were? Neighbors were evacuated. They were neighbors evacuated. And, with, uh, and to that point, this is a good opportunity to talk about uh, safety for community. Many of those that were uh, within the area of private residence refused to leave. And so uh, we continue to ask those neighbor, or those uh, those community folks to to leave that area and they refused. And that, that, that situation was very fluid and continued to work uh, to keep the officers safe and attempt to try to keep the community safe. So uh, we will continue to work uh, together to uh, make that situation better. Um, do you know when Rolls took his own life, like around what time and then um, how long until he determined that that had happened, please? We knew instantaneously by the, by the drone footage, about 3 a.m. Uh, Chief, you talked about the fair market value being rewarded to the, to the homeowner, which would be the landlord in this case. So for the tenant, Andrea Young, and the family, what's the city doing because they're being misplaced by what happened given the circumstances? I appreciate that question, Dave. Thank you for it. During the situation, it was ongoing. Our staff, my staff, was looking for uh, residence for Mrs. Young. Uh, at that time, it was for a temporary hotel stay uh, because of the incident. After the incident, we immediately began to talk to Mrs. Young about another permanent stay. Staff member of mine is in contact, was in constant contact with Mrs. Young, looking for a different permanent residence for her and assisting her, assisting her in doing so. So and it has not ceased, we are still doing so. Again, what about her personal belongings? And for homeowners in Kalamazoo, do you have some words of assurance that this isn't gonna happen to me? We spoke with Mrs. Young. Those things that cannot be recovered, we will give her fair market value for those. We have a process for that and, and, and liability coverage. She has been given that information as well. And for homeowners in Kalamazoo, these assurances, concerns. I'm a homeowner in Kalamazoo. You know, I, my audience is homeowners in Kalamazoo. Yeah. If we, in the process of this, there's a process for us in liability. In doing so, we can make a claim to our liability insurance. It will be reviewed by the city attorney. Uh, and he, along with the city manager's office, will then determine if that claim is worth uh, um, insurance. So, Chief, what goes through your mind um, when you first 
about that phone call. So it's going to stand up with that, a standoff with people who's happening. Um, one of our officers have been injured. How do you go from there and a message to the community? What goes through my mind is keeping this community safe, keeping the officers safe, and asking this young man to surrender so he can face the criminal charges that that will present for the arrest warrant. Mitigating through that, and then as the nights progress, as a man, as a chief, as a father, this is an awful situation for our community. This is a tragic event in our community. No one, not me, or the city of Kalamazoo, or my leadership, wanted this tragedy to happen. This is terrible. Did the knowledge that Paul had previously told relatives that he would uh, do the standoff, I can't remember the exact phrase he used, and then also he made a Facebook post about an hour into the standoff saying, um, as MJ said, this is it. Did that change how you guys responded to this incident at all? I don't know anything about that statement on Facebook. We reacted to the behavior of Mr. Rowe. So the statement you learned, detectives learned about before the standoff started, where he said, uh, he said something about he wanted to shoot it out with the police. Did that change? You learned that before the standoff. Did that change how you approached this incident on Monday? No, at all. Um, you mentioned that. Oh, sorry. Uh, you mentioned that your officers were helping Andrea and her family find the police. Um, are they? I guess who is someone helping them pay for that? Is and, and if so, where is that money coming from? Coming from the city of Kalamazoo. Um, was the uh, were, were the tenants uh, aware that the uh, the man that was staying on her on their couch that they had a gun inside, or were they just completely unaware of uh, the? You know the crimes that he had committed and whatnot. I don't know. Okay, we have time for one more question. What is the status of the woman who was shot in the first? Uh, to my knowledge, she's still recovering. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really quickly, I know uh, we got the sheriff to really put some step words. Yes. And then uh, following that, we will also give an opportunity. We got some of our elected officials here. So if there's anyone that you would like to speak to, I know the mayor has some stuff that he wants to. Three shots, so hopefully I'll be okay this far away from you. Um, first, I want to say I'm just going to save some words from the representing the commission, and and uh, probably won't be perfect, and I may not fully represent everyone's feelings, but I'll do my best. But but if it's not perfect, that's not. Uh, I want to recognize the commissioner, you know, newly uh, reelected now, Commissioner Cooney's here, Commissioner Hess is here in the room, and. I would say every commissioner knows this is going on. Uh, some could not be here, but that doesn't mean they have any less concern about this event than anyone who is able to be here, uh, uh, basically, for this moment. We were talking about this incident last night between various commissioners, uh, literally till 11.30 at night, and very, very desirous of uh, what is occurring today. Is information getting out. I would say the general consensus is this is a tragedy for everyone involved and our entire community. And that's an absolute
consensus of the city commission. One thing that's difficult when you're on the city commission, and we've got several newly elected uh, members who just got sworn in on Monday, is that people that know you in the community reach out and want to know answers right away in real time. And that is very difficult, being an individual who's been elected to serve, to not have those answers in that moment, to not provide a clarifying statement. That's difficult. And I want to thank the chief very much for quickly putting together a presentation that helps us understand what we can know about that incident. And some of these things really are available as information to the commission at the same time the whole community sees it. That's frustrating for commissioners, but it does not mean that commissioners are disengaged and don't care. I want to say that as it relates to the family that has been displaced, as we all have great concerns about, in particular, the children. I mean, this is an event that will inalterably change their lives. Individual commissioners on that day and since that time have reached out to do what they could do individually to help this family, to help our team here at Public Safety do what they need to do, to connect community resources. It is our commitment that this family will seamlessly be able to move to a new housing situation, will be able to have what they need to successfully occupy the residence. That's an individual commitment from commissioners, from our community partners, and from the city. Lastly, just from all of us on the commission, and I'm reinforcing what the chief has just said, is that we are extending our condolences, our heartfelt, deep, profound condolences to family members, to friends, to people that know and love, people that were directly involved in this, to our public safety officers who put their lives at risk to protect the community, to our partners in the sheriff's department that did the same thing. Individuals that step forward and also put themselves directly at risk to make sure that other people don't get hurt. But our condolences are extended to the community as well. These kinds of traumatic events ripple outwards through a neighborhood, through a whole city. It is going to reinforce our efforts, which we have already committed additional funding to, matched by Kalamazoo County, to get to the roots of gun violence and to prevent this kind of thing from happening in the future. And I appreciate so much all of your interest. It is the case that these days, with the media that's available to every one of us, sometimes misinformation gets out there people begin to believe a narrative that is not fully representative of what is happening. So to that end, it's impossible to be in front of that, but our efforts on the commission are to bring timely, real, factual information to the community so everyone can make up their own minds about what happened but understand the care that will be driving our response after the fact. So I appreciate that. Great, that concludes our uh, press conference and presentation for the day. I wanna thank you all for making time uh, to come out today. Um, have a great Thursday and uh, try to take care of it.